Welcome back to our journey to Eden. I am Shailen Fair, and today you and I are going to journey with Emma Heath, who shares with us her story of overcoming alcohol addiction as she was drinking from the time she was 11 years old. What I love about our conversation is that she really opens up about what it was like being in the grips of addiction, the denial, her life spinning out of control into chaos, and also the isolation that addicts feel. There is a really amazing quote that I love, and I think it just rings true for every single human, and it goes, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, but connection. And I think that is something that we all deeply need, crave, and were created for. And that is true heart-to-heart connection, being honest with how we feel, sharing from that deep, honest place within us in our relationships, being heard and understood. And I think when we are living life at that depth, it kind of fills up the empty spaces so that addiction can't really take root within us. But apart from that point, Emma does also share very practical steps in how she journeyed out of addiction into redemption and now helps others. So enjoy this conversation and please will you like, subscribe and comment on this video below if you are watching on YouTube. I get so encouraged when I see one little like on my YouTube videos or if somebody subscribes or comments. So please do encourage me and let me know you are journeying with me as I make this beautiful content for all you adventurers. Enjoy. Welcome Emma. Thank you for being here with me today. You're welcome. Yeah, we're here in your home, which is currently being renovated. Yeah, we are behind the one wall that is actually presentable. <laughs> yes. Um, finally, we've been talking about doing this for ages, so thank yeah. you. Um, and you've got an amazing story about overcoming addiction, and you've had your journey, and now you're helping people as well work through their addictions and bad habits. So maybe we could just start off with you telling us your story and go right back to the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. And yeah. um, I'll be honest, I can't believe the stuff that's happened more recent, but we'll come on to that. And then I guess, like, I I don't know if I was born with addiction. Um, some people think it's sort of inherited. Um, I, I used to joke when I was young, saying if you had the parents I had, no one's... Uh, um, we may have gone down the addiction route um, because my dad was um, the managing director for Guinness and my mum was a pharmacist and um, my story encapsulates um, alcohol and, you know, recreational drugs. And um, yeah, so, but it all began, I'll be honest, I can really remember at the age of 11 and I started feeling, I was bullied at school. I don't, I, I well, I don't blame um, school for that or anything or all the bullies but um, I just felt really different and I didn't have a dad around he'd left when I was tiny so straight away as a youngster I felt really sort of separate from people I also had food allergies so all that combined um, to the point where I couldn't even eat like anything with cow's milk in so I'd have to go home separately um, at lunchtime and from school and everything just pushed to me feeling like the odd one out, you know, the black mm. sheep type thing. And I um, I started feeling that my life was out of control. And I started, I don't even how, know how I got even got the idea of doing it, but I started messing around with food. Um, and I went through the whole spectrum of anorexia, bulimia, overeating, exercise anything to change how I felt but I didn't like how I was externally and internally um I was brought up in a, a beautiful home even though my dad wasn't around but you know my mum had strong faith and I'd go to Sunday school and stuff like that and but I'll be honest I um I remember the communion wine and I used to really enjoy it just that little like head rush of, of just a sip of alcohol and I I think with all the eating disorder bubbling away, um, I found alcohol at the age of 13. And I, where I didn't feel I fitted in at school, I would go and get alcohol, get fake ID and start 
you know, giving it to people to try and fit in with them, the in crowd, you know, and they would be the in crowd that would go drinking after school or on weekends. And, and straight away, it, it did something for me that I didn't feel I was getting in my life of feeling connected to people. And it was fun for a while. Um, but with anybody that's gone through addiction or, you know, been gripped by something like that, there's a time where it changes. Um, but it was many years later, um, and I, I wish I'd, I wish I'd listened to people at the time saying, you know, the amount of people that said, Emma, don't you drink, think you drink too much, or, you know, and and they could see, people could see that I was, you know, abusing food, as well, and that it was just a really painful place. Mm. I remember my mum joined me at a leisure club where there was a swimming pool. So she could monitor my weight more because I would wear baggy jumpers. I'd I'd hide so much. Um, and my life ended up for someone trying to find some control, being so out of control. It, it, that's the thing. It, it almost, I became powerless over it. And um, I think when I found alcohol, though, it did something inside me. It just lit me up as an expression. that It just made me feel alive. And I could be confident. I could talk to people I could you know be everything I thought I wanted to be and I thought alcohol was my best friend and then I the consequences started happening mm. um, for, for me and I went to university and I was really well educated you know I it wasn't so problematic at that time and I went to university and it, I mean it was quite funny because I I didn't know I had a problem with alcohol at this point, but I was drinking most days. And I remember I went to um, I went to a few different universities to see which one I wanted to go to because I had really good grades. And I, I went to Cardiff, and the um, the lecturer basically sat me down and said, "You can choose any of these degrees. You've got the grades." And they offered me business studies. And straight away, and I realise now that I had an excuse for everything that was normally good for me. Um, that's just sort of been a pattern. Um, mm. And I thought, no, I'm not doing business studies. It's too for people that are too clever, you know. Um, then they offered me um, sports recreation, and I thought, no, that's too energetic, you know. And then it got to hospitality management, and I didn't have a clue what that was. Um, and I just said, to, I remember so clearly saying to the lecturer, you know, what what does that entail? And he said, oh, there's wine tasting on a Friday. And automatically I grabbed the pen. I remember grabbing the pen on this guy's desk, signing my name next to the, this degree that I was going to do for four years. And I was off and running, you know, and I didn't realise many of my decisions were based on alcohol. And looking back, and hindsight's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I had a lot of fun with alcohol as well. You know, I went to university. I I studied hard. I partied hard. It, you know, I lived with big groups of girls. We'd go out. You know, it was all, all fun. Um, and, but then I realised I was drinking more than my friends. But still, I wasn't ready to admit that. I was still in denial about that. I just said I was a party girl. Um, and you know having fun and and all that and and it wasn't you know I, I got into a lot of scrapes I I would wake up not knowing where I was who I was with um, and that was you know not my good morals you know put a drink inside me and my morals go out of the window um, but it was a almost like a training ground for what was coming for me um, so when I left university I this is my wisdom. I decided to go abroad and run nightclubs, um, which is probably the worst place for somebody that had alcoholism bubbling away in them. Um, and I, I went to university, um, you know, to study, and I ended up leaving running nightclubs, and that was awful. Um, drinking every day um, in a place that really disrespected women. Um, I, but again, I didn't care about all the stuff going on around me and all the corrupt kind of way of the world. I just remember just drinking every day, but it, I could start to see the darkness coming in. Um, and I remember there was one time there was a, a girl got attacked in our nightclub and I was too drunk to do much about it. 
Um, and I I always remember things like that, you know, the, the way I wasn't present. Um, and I I left that place. It was it was horrific actually, because I'd got into a really abusive relationship out there. And um again, had I have had clarity and not been so consumed with alcohol, there's no way I would have been in that situation. Um and I rem- remember on the the flight back after three and a half years of being there. I was on this flight, I'd, I'd managed to escape. I was in prison for a month by this person in a, in an apartment and abroad, you know, when you have those houses with the metal bars across to stop, you know, people getting in. Well, I couldn't get out because he locked me in and I'd managed to get away, but he'd found me and, you know. That, but anyway, I sat on this plane, black and blue, and hadn't had a drink of alcohol for about 12 hours and I started shaking. The physical withdrawal of the alcohol was the first time that I really, really felt it, probably because of everything that had happened as well. Um, And I remember it was raining as as I left this country um, on the plane. And as I went over the clouds, the sun was shining and I felt like I've got a, a real you know, strong faith today, but I felt like God was saying to me, you know, above all the pain, all the darkness, I don't know why I'm getting emotional because it's like, but there's always hope. There's always, the sun will always shine behind those clouds, you know, and it it was just for me, just a little sign that there still was hope. And I think I knew that I was drinking too much and that my life was a mess and, You know, I came home to the UK and got some medical help um, for what had happened over there. Um, But then I'd love to say that that was a wake up call and I stopped drinking. I didn't. I think at that point I was dependent on alcohol, like physically. And I, I carried on drinking for a few years. Um, And I was in my sort of mid twenties at that point. And um, I went to, I ended up, some people, you couldn't not see it anymore. I I couldn't hide it. You know, I wasn't functioning. I I, I moved out of my mum's home and moved into a flat in Wales and just drank. And the only person I'd see is even my mum who'd come and just check if I was alive Um, or the Tesco delivery guy where I'd get my drink from. And, you know, I'd spend all my money on drink and I'd sit in that flat and just cry and, and know this wasn't, the person I was meant to be, but I was too gripped by it all that I I didn't know a way out. I didn't know anyone that had been through what I'd been through. I didn't know there was any help out there, but gradually um, I, I engaged with the local drug and alcohol services, but it, it didn't really work for me. I went into a few detoxes, came out and just drank again. Mm. And, and I knew I needed something different. And, and amazingly, my mum, being a pharmacist, managed to get me some help through the pharmaceutical society and um, they normally only help people under 18 but they made an exception and they helped me to go into a rehab um, in Wiltshire in the UK and that's where my recovery journey began really and um, it, it was a 12-step treatment centre which is 12 steps are like AA Alcoholics Anonymous and, and I remember seeing these 12 steps on the wall um, and it, it goes through like a series of things that you follow. And and I thought, you know, there was a part that is about making amends. And I knew how to say sorry to people all the time because that's all I ever did. You know, prior to going in there, I'd lost my driving license through drink driving. I, you know, I, I could have easily killed someone in that. I was unemployable. I was drinking two litres of vodka a day, just wanting to die. And... Um, I, I don't even recognise myself in those pictures. Um, and internally and externally, I was just dying. Um, and I just, I, I when I used to say sorry, I meant it with my whole heart. And then I'd be completely baffled at why I was doing it again. And anyway, I turned up at this rehab and I basically, if you'd have asked me then who I was, what you know? I think all I could tell you was my name. I didn't know what colour I liked. I didn't know what music I liked to listen to, even clothes. I, what, 
was interested in anything. I didn't everything had gone out the window because alcohol had just dominated everything. And so many people had said along the way, you know, you're such a lovely girl. Why can't you just stop? Mm. And it's not that I didn't want to. I didn't know how to, and it had taken over. So when I went to this rehab, they, um, I went through a detox, and um, that was that was tough. That was horrible. Um, but I think what was horrible was coming through that without the alcohol and not having a clue who I was. Mm. But I also believe now that being so unbelievably broken, for me, is a gift because it gave me a chance to recreate myself I thought I wanted to be Emma before I started drinking well that was a 13 year old scared insecure frightened little girl Mm. and actually I see now that I had this opportunity and I grabbed it with both hands I'll be honest and um, I I literally did the time in this um, residential place um, six weeks and went to another treatment centre in London that was all women and when they told me it was a women's treatment centre, I was absolutely like, I'm not going. Because all I'd done through the latter part of my drinking had surrounded myself with guys because I do believe that women with women, it's really powerful. You can sort of see through some of the, the masks that I could create um, when I was around men, you know. Sorry to interrupt the story. I just want to quickly let you know about a really gorgeous series I produced with John Sparks, who was a counsellor for over 50 years. We unpack the four different temperaments, the choleric, sanguine, melancholic, and phlegmatic. When you know your temperament and the temperament mix of your loved one, it will help you connect with yourself and with others at a deeper level. And that's why this podcast is here, to help you connect with yourself, others and God at a real depth so head over to YouTube and check out the series and being in the ladies treatment centre it really helped me just to get to know who I was as a woman and um, I remember one time they gave me an assignment on anger and I didn't think I was an angry person in my drinking days or anything and I was like I'm not angry you know it's it, I and mean, it's all about learning about who you are and um, I went to Alcoholics Anonymous for the fellowships and reconnected with my faith, which was really important. Um, and yeah, just started getting engaged, involved with stuff. I got a little part-time job in a yoga centre in London. And, um, and I'll be honest, when I, when I went to that rehab, I said to myself, I will never, ever, ever work in addiction. Um, I've lived a life of it. You know what I mean? It's gripped me. I don't, you know, I see the mess and carnage and like God's got a very funny um, sense of humour um, because over the years um, I started volunteering with addiction services, engaged back with my church. Um, I, I'd i love to tell you that I'm 16, 17 years sober now uh, because that's when I was 28 when I um, got into rehab but that isn't my story and um, I don't recommend a relapse for anybody but for me it, it, it helped to change some things because a lot had happened in my um, the first period of recovery but I felt that I was cherry picking parts of, of what a recovery journey is and I was telling people what I thought they wanted to hear but I was really unwell at one point with the early stages of cancer and I um, I didn't tell anyone how bad I felt inside and I would mask it and I was fine I was fine but inside I was just a mess um, but I got through that but then I, I picked up a drink and um, in that last drink I had um, which is 11 years ago now over 11 years ago all the things escalated really quickly I ended up um, drink driving again um, I broke from my toe, I, you know, the carnage I caused, um, got banned from a local shop, you know, all the things. And that was just in the space of a couple of weeks of drinking. Um, and in that last um, drunk drive episode, I, I basically reversed into a car on a dual carriageway and um, someone did a citizen's arrest on me. Um, and I'm actually really grateful for that. And um, I remember in that police cell in Bournemouth, um, I was so ashamed of myself. 
Um, but I also, there's a saying in AA, which is a, a belly full of beer and a head full of AA or recovery doesn't work. And I was at a real crossroads because I knew that if I left there, I could either drink or I could do everything I could to not drink. But the the power of the sort of one, you know, my head was saying, oh, I just have a few, you know. Um, and I left that um, police cell in the police station and they gave me enough money for my bus fare home and I went to an off licence and bought the nastiest, cheapest bottle of wine around and went back to my place in Bournemouth and just drank it and as every single sip I had, I, it was like putting poison in my system. I knew it was going to hurt me but I still did it anyway and, um, and basically I I then reached out for help pretty, pretty much straight away. And that's key, is actually having the courage to reach out for help, not knowing what that looks like. And I knew I had to do something. And I reached out to my mum. My mum came over from Wales and, um, you know, sat with me, talked to me, prayed with me. And I went back to AA meetings and I, I remember going in just crying my eyes out. And this woman came up to me at the end and she said, um, oh, I needed to hear that and be reminded of how bad it is out there. And I thought, are oh, you cheeky? So-and-so, you know? But I realised what she meant because I need to see people coming back into fellowship meetings, wherever it may be, to, to make me realise I don't want to go back there. And I think I made a decision there and then to do things differently and tell people the honest truth of where I was at, mm. and not just a little bit of it. And... Um, and it's painful being honest with someone about your deepest, darkest thoughts and behaviours because it's that stuff that gets me drunk. Um, but I knew I needed to do something different and I, I, you know, it's been the most probably painful and amazing 11 years that I've known. Um, I think when you put down a substance or a habit that is encompassing your life because you're doing it to not feel. Suddenly when you haven't got that, you feel everything a million times more. And I I think, I mean, there's a, something happened when I was six weeks sober um, in 2012. And it was the 12th of the 12th of the 12th. And I'll always remember that date <laughs> because it's quite easy to remember. But um, I basically... Before I drank the last time, I wanted to take my mum somewhere nice that she'd always wanted to go as a way to say sorry to her for some of the things I've done. And I decided to take her to Iceland. And um, I took her away and we came back and to my place in Borma. And she, she would chat away in the morning. She'd just woken up and then literally she just fell on the floor. And I thought she just tripped over. I honestly did. And and she hadn't, she'd had a sudden cardiac arrest and I've never seen it, like as you see it on telly, it's nothing like on television when it's happening in front of you, let alone to somebody you love so much and, and she started going grey and, you know, blue and gasping for like breath but it actually, you know, she was pretty much, you know, hard stopped and I... I don't know if people believe in God or not, but my goodness, there was, I don't believe in coincidences, I believe in God incidences. And I went and got to see who else was in this block that I was in, and there was a, a mass in, in her room. And I, I said, Come quick, something's happened to mom. And she came in and she'd just done her CPR training, like literally two weeks before. And I knew a little bit of CPR training, and we both started it with the paramedics on the phone. Um, and they were telling us, talking us through stuff. She was doing it to Nelly the Elephant. I was doing it to the Vinnie Jones adverts on TV, Staying Alive. Uh, it sounds quite comical at the time, um, but you just do what you've got to do. And, um, there's a saying I always remember that recovery and working a program gives you, it, it says we intuitively knew how to handle situations that would normally baffle us and it's not every day you come across something like that but it was like adrenaline kicked in and, and I remember just waiting for these paramedics to come while we're doing CPR and my mum's 
ribs had cracked and different things and you know there was no life on her but we carried on and and I started like worrying like are they going to come but it was only I think it was eight or nine minutes it took for the paramedics to come um, and they just came in, rushed in, took over, and all I could do in that moment was stand back. Um, and when we talk about addiction a lot, we talk about being powerless over not just alcohol or whatever it might be as a substance or habit, but over people, places, and things. And I had to stand back, and I was completely powerless over what was going on. But you know, I did. I started praying, and I was saying, "There's a." something they use in the fellowship called the serenity prayer. And I was saying that out loud, uh, you know, and, and I felt this peace just come in that room of chaos, mm. um, like I've never known. And I've only ever experienced something like it a few times. And and I just knew it was going to be all right. But then the paramedic that had the, uh, you know, shocking paddle, paddles in his hand, he turned to me and he said, I'm so sorry, we can't do any more. And I... I basically just literally looked at him because this peace had filled me and I just said, please, can you try one more time in the quietest, calmest voice? And he just did. And then my mum's heart started. And, um, yeah, I, I was able to be a daughter to her and be in the hospital and, you know, basically nurse you know, her so back to health. And I remember when she, she came around um, several days later and she... She looked at me and in her own words, she just said, Emma, I'm powerless as well. And, and we just had that common, we knew, you know, understood each other. And I think that's half the stuff with addiction is the language sometimes. Um, and, you know, the gifts of recovery, being able to be a daughter um, and help her to get back on track. You know, more recently, she's not well. Um, you know, I've been able to care for her. I get it wrong. I'm not a great carer. You know, I, I'm quite impatient. I'm quite an all or nothing. Like, and you know, I'm not the best daughter, but I am a daughter, mm. um, and I've been able to be employable again. And um, I sometimes look at my keys I carry, like with my car keys on and stuff. And you know, I've got a key for a house today that that's mine. I've got a key to a church that um, I go to. I've got a key to an office. You know, um, it's just, it's not about all the tangible stuff either that, mm -hmm. that recovery gives. It's so much more than that. But, you know, I'm able to dream and believe that my dreams will happen mm -hmm. rather than hopeless dreams. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've got a partner that I know loves me and I love him, which I never believed I could love anybody um, or that I was lovable myself. Mm -hmm. um, I met my dad for the first time ever, um, seven years ago now um, we're never going to have a daughter father relationship but I was able to go and drive um, to his doorstep and meet this man um, mm. and forgive him actually for leaving and I think I've carried so much unforgiveness and stuff in my life um, which probably contributed to turning to things to, to numb that and um, yeah I run a charity today which is it's, uh, I still pinch myself, you know, that I'm even sober, let alone in a position to have a team of people working with me, um, helping other people in addiction. It's, um, yeah, it's absolutely bonkers, really. Wow, such a powerful story. And there's so much that we can pick out of that. But there's maybe just one or two things that you could kind of go deeper into Um the one thing was just about how, I guess, denial um, and kind of on the same page as that, the, um, the numbing of emotions, kind of denying that you're in this position, but then underlying that is the, all those painful emotions that maybe addicts and humans would protect ourselves because we don't want to look at them. Yeah. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit into uh, kind of how that shell of denial broke open? Yeah. Is it, and and then I guess the Pandora, Pandora's box opened and having to deal with all the painful things. Was there certain things that helped you along that journey of 
starting to feel again and yeah. being real with your feelings? Mm. I think, I mean, denial is there almost as a protection method for some people, I think. And for me, I got to the point where I couldn't not address it. It was, a, like I said, it was a case of, I know I'm going to die or I do something different. Um, there's a lot of shame attached to addiction. Um, but I do think that the more people talk about it, the more people can open up about it. Because most people, like, you know, have some form of habit or destructive behaviour in their life. Um, but addiction has got such a connotation of such a harsh word, um, you know, and actually I always say addiction, destructive behaviours and compulsive habits, you know, um, because they reckon about 80 to 90% of people have one of those. Um, and they're all interlinked. You know, we live in a world where we're programmed to be addicted to stuff, you know, social media. Yeah, pretty much you... everyone's addicted to social media. Yeah. Everyone, everyone's got an addiction. Yeah, or take yeah. someone's phone off them. Yeah. How do they react? You yeah. know, um, you know, most some people with food, you know, it's but oh we eat so it's socially acceptable to but we you know, there are things that we're all most people have in their lives that are destructive and actually I think it's a way that alcohol and drugs are perceived. Um, but, you know, there's so many. Um, but I think the denial, for me, it almost like my consequences smash, had to smash the denial because mm. I realised it wasn't right and everyone else around me saw that. Um, did it have to just get to that extreme point for the denial to break? It did for me, yeah. but I see other people that don't have to get to that point. Yeah. You know, they, they might actually. I think that's where addiction is so cunning and baffling and powerful in that everybody's stopping point is different. It, and one glove doesn't fit all. You know, some people could go to a, a rehab once, boom, get it, amazing, never ever think about it again. I know people that have been into rehabs 30, 40 times and I think they've become almost addicted to the cycle of, you know, drinking or doing drugs, mm. getting to breaking point, going into rehab, coming out. Um, that's why it's so different and it's I think I realised that for me I needed to be taken out of my environment and put somewhere else without all the distractions you know and, and a big common fact for people with addiction is quite a not chaotic mind but they can they jump from one thing to the next a lot and I was like that so to be almost you know, locked away for a little bit was actually um, really important mm. yeah. and as you start to become more real with your feelings and the reality of life and where you were, was there any practices, any steps that you, I guess it's quite a big question, of how you dealt with those hard feelings and painful things like unforgiveness and, you know, if you had any grudges or, you know, just the pain from childhood, even growing up without a father, you know. So I think it's really important when um, you grab hold of all the services that are on offer and because they're there to, as a buffer to support you going through. Because I realised for me that alcohol wasn't my problem. It was more the solution to the underlying problem I had, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, I, I drank because of pain, because of unresolved stuff, things that I'd never dealt with in my life. Um, and that was then, alcohol was just the result of that. Um, that's how I see it. And so to get into recovery and then start looking at all these things, having the right people around you is key. So mm -hmm. if it if it's, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, you have people around you that you meet, a sponsor. If it's a rehab, there's a staff team of people. You know, I don't know many people that are in such a bad way that could do this on their own. Um, mm -hmm. The value of people is really important. And I remember there's this analogy about, you know, when geese fly in formation in a V shape, um, the reason it's like that is because they alternate so that they can, you know, catch the tailwind and they encourage each other and they can fly like, I think it's something like eight times further when they're in that V than if they're on their own. And that always reminds me a bit about recovery and that I, I don't think I could have done it, number one, on my own, and number two, without a higher power, which I choose to call God, you know, um, and having the people around you that could help you because there's parts of, unraveling the mess of our lives you know like you said opening pandora's box that uh, they're scary they're, they're it's a lot for an individual to deal with you know and, and people will end up relapsing and going back to things rather than address stuff mm. um so having a good structure around you i think is so important and that's why i'm so passionate about 
like the work I do with churches and organisations in equipping teams, because often people jump in and just help people, but actually it's the people that help the people that need the help as well. Yes. You know. Yes. There's a, I can't remember what the quote is, but it is something to do with how um, addiction is a underlying it all. It's a connection issue. We don't know how to connect with ourselves, God, or other people. So we haven't got those, that deep connection going. So there is this big void. Mm-hmm. And then that void starts to create, all you know, latching onto drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever addiction, you know, we can get our hands on. Well, any void so, you try and fill, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you have started to help people now mm-hmm. with addiction. Can you talk a little bit about steps to active recovery? Yes. Uh, so I... Years ago, um, when I got into my recovery journey, I started working with churches and um, helping run courses and different things when I was ready to. And um, I became a trustee with a charity um, and started setting up courses around the country. And then I saw that it's all well and good just running courses. But actually, like I said a minute ago, like the team are so important. And I, um, I basically... Decide, I had this idea and it was bubbling around in my head and it was a lot of healthy frustration because I've met loads of people that want to help people in addiction but they don't know how to and can actually be quite damaging in that um, and um, you know like I met a group of people that went and bought a lady that was in their home group like a church group um, a car and that lady couldn't leave the house without drinking neat vodka and they've given her the keys to a car you know a few ton vehicle that would kill her or someone else and so I realised there's a bit of a lack in education around addiction. Um, and it's either very clinical or not much at all. So I I had this idea and I went away and I just brainstormed and I wrote and wrote and wrote and came up with this like 16-page document and was like, um, this is how we could create a model to help churches and organisations to upskill. And I didn't do much with it, but people get got put in my path and um, I, well, I met a concept design specialist who's become a really good friend of mine now. And um, I said, look, could you just look at this? Just because I just wanted to offload it. It was in my mind. And she looked at it. She said, Emma, there's something in this, you know. And I was like, yeah, right. And at the time, I was working for a local charity. And um, basically, I... She, you know, she started working with me on it, and then someone donated a bit of money to this idea, and that was, gosh, four years ago now, mm-hmm. and it became a charity, and it's grown pretty quick. Yeah. Um, so we've written courses, we've um, helped, yeah, but helped quite a lot of different churches and organisations and communities um, in running addiction work, and we've just launched a new model of it, um, and yeah, it's just. I, I would love to see, we call it STAR, Steps to Active Recovery. Um, and basically, I'd love to see a STAR centre in every town mm. um, in the UK because the local government do a lot as well, but it's limited. Whereas if we upskill the church, which has got the largest group of volunteers known, um, in just a fraction, it's a bit like I say, I only knew a fraction of CPR and it helped to save my mum's mm. life. You know, if if team of people in a community knew a fraction more about addiction that would be enough to change yeah. the trajectory of people's lives and that's what we want to see mm-hmm. and um yeah i'm excited to see where it goes we've got like six staff and mm-hmm. an office and yeah what would you say about um so i had a conversation recently with someone about the 12 steps program and they have a faith but they basically said they're not going to do that, you know, AA, because um, addiction is, at the end of the day, it's just sin and you people can use the word addiction as an excuse. Uh, so what would you say about that? Maybe people who have got a sincere faith but over-spiritualise the word sin and you know get confused with addiction and yeah what would you say? it's funny because I when I first got into re- like running recovery things at church I was um I did it with a lovely lady called Susie and we both had alcoholic backgrounds 
I don't call myself an alcoholic today. Um, but I do when I'm in an AA meeting, just because it's the etiquette of the meeting. Um, because I don't want to like name myself. I'm, I'm Emma, who's in recovery from that now, and I've had alcohol problems. Um, but I, Susie and I, we both were very similar in our journey now. But she'd come into a church one day, got hit by the spirit, and literally had no desire to ever drink again. I went down, like I explained, that whole like years of re like rehabs and treatment centers. But ultimately, we still came to the same point. And I believe that, it, you know, it, it, everyone's different. And I've had so many people say to me, you know, oh, you know, you've got faith. Surely God, you know, could just stop that. Well, yeah, he probably could. But also everyone's wired up different. And I knew I needed more community and different things. And I think that was actually God being really sensitive to what mm. I needed. Mm. Um, so I don't think there's anything wrong in saying that people have addiction. Um, in a way, um, but I, like I said, I don't like to call myself an alcoholic today because I believe that, you know, I, I have been set free of that. Mm. Um, and I remember, it's funny, I, I ended up having to go back to court to get my driving license back early and I had to swear on the Bible in the court. And then um, literally, I remember one of the judges asking me, will I ever drink again? And that's a really hard question to ask someone like me when my default setting is to drink and um, and basically, I just said to him, as long as I keep God at the centre, I keep helping people, you know, um, and be a productive member of society and keep grateful. I don't believe I ever have to drink again. Mm. Um, but, you know, there's so many different um, perceptions of what addiction is to, to individuals. Mm. And I, I, I'm a bit bold in saying, but the person maybe that has said that maybe hasn't had the sort of addiction that many of us have where mm. it is life and death and you're completely powerless over it. You know, the amount of times I cried out to God, you know, help me and, and everything. And I ended up that the addiction was so powerful. Mm. Um, yes, there's things in addiction that cause sin, but an addiction it's per se is a, a sin in itself. But who doesn't sin you know it's just the way that the connotations of addiction mm -hmm. and it's the way i see it as well is that god you know yes sometimes there is a complete change in someone overnight or in one moment to have some kind of amazing experience but then for the rest of us there's these tools yeah. that wise people and people like yourself who have gone through the journey you've looked back and you've seen the steps you've you've taken to walk into wholeness and recovery and then you're able to take that and give that formula, tool, steps to other people. And that's what 12 steps and, you know, these things are. That's how I see it, you know. That's what they say. provides those tools yeah. to practical tools. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I, it's funny because in recovery we say about um, having a toolkit and you have to keep adding to that toolkit because yeah. there's different situations that you're going to need different things to deal with, you know. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so. Well, to come in for landing here, if there was just a few of your tools that you could share with people listening, say somebody who's, you know, walking through, maybe they're not even hectically into their addiction, maybe things aren't so catastrophic, but they have got something in their life that they want to address. Mm. And you want to just hand them a few tools from your toolkit. Mm, I did. You give them. <laughs> I did. The biggest thing would probably be to to talk to someone about it because you don't have to get to the point where it's so bad. You can jump off that that you know path at any time and stop that ha happening. You know, um, I'm really passionate about helping to educate people and preventative stuff. But um, yeah, definitely talk to people if there's something bothering you. There's something wrong. You know. Um, and the, I think the biggest thing for me to not feel such a failure in this is that the world is telling us to be addicted to stuff, you know. So very few people don't go through life without being pulled in that direction some way, shape or form. Um, and there's I, my biggest thing would be to say there's no shame in saying that there is something gripping your life that you need help with. Um, the shame is when you don't get help, to be honest, and you end up, you know, financially in trouble you know losing your marriage or you know what I mean or in hospital or you know many people I know have died through this stuff 
Um, and it gets worse if it's not addressed. Um, and ultimately, we all got have pain, and it just ma- you know it, it comes out in different ways. And for some people like myself, my the way I was in pain, I reached out for alcohol, you know. Um, but I'd just say reach out to a friend. Um, someone you trust um, and talk about it. There are also really great organisations out there for things that if people are too ashamed of stuff, whether it be sexual addiction or things that are the taboo subjects, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing so many more people coming forward with things like that because a bit like mental health has been talked about a lot more recently. You know, we need to be talking about addiction more Um, and and dispelling the stigma attached to it because there's there's no shame in it. Um, Mm. So yeah, I'd say reach out for help. My biggest thing would probably be that recovery is fun. If I, I thought that putting down the drink would be boring. Mm. Oh my goodness, it's so not. It's like I li- my life is beyond my wildest dreams. Yeah. Um, never give up hope because I believe there's hope for everybody. You know, mm. I remember like in that rehab, I was so anxious. I couldn't be around more than about two people at a time because of anxiety. I couldn't imagine my life being different. I couldn't imagine my life without alcohol. I couldn't imagine my life being able to be around people and talk to them. And, you know, I now get to do, well, talk. I talked at a conference of 1,700 women. I mean, I literally still pinch myself. It's like, how on earth? Um, but don't give up on your dreams, you know, mm. um, because they can still happen. It's beautiful, Emma. Thank you. How can we find you online? And if somebody wants to reach out and get involved with yeah. Steps to Active Recovery? So the website is www.starrecovery.org. And um, people can email in to my colleague info at starrecovery.org. Um, we have online courses so people can join online if they feel they've got something in their life they want some help with. They run, we run two a year, um, but also on our website, it shows where recovery is. We've, we're designing a UK discovery network, so it will be in time, a place that anybody can find support around the country, not just what we do, but what else, you know, some of the other good stuff out there. You know, the thing is, there is some good stuff out there. It's just knowing where it is. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just reach out. Thank you so much, Emma. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being here with me today on our journey to Eden. Without you listening and watching and engaging with me, there would be no journey together. So thank you so much for being here and I will see you next time. The music that you hear in this episode is from the Moses Brothers, a musical group based in Cornwall made up of the Moses Brothers and I love their music so thank you to the Moses Brothers for letting me use their song